The Department of Health, in collaboration with the University of the Free State, is hosting its 8th annual Free State Provincial Health Research Day. Experts from various fields in the health sector and research communities will be sharing their findings, have networking sessions and innovative collaborations. Let's go inside to find out more. This is the eighth research day that we are holding today. We, we, we have annual research days, two days in a year, every year, since 2012, uh, where we, there are concepts that are being uh, discussed here the research questions and we also and they also are either the university or the department because we do this in collaboration with the university those research researches are undertaken and then some of them we take some of the recommendations from the research papers and we, we they, they help us formulate the policies in the department the recognition ratio of the deteriorating patient remains suboptimal despite the color coded vital sign record providing more explicit flagging of patients potentially deteriorating the greatest incidence of these color of these care failures was still in our general nursing unit and we found this out by the analysis of failure to rescue um, adverse events we actually also in our mortality audits often picked up this um, patients that was not rescued and showed signs of deterioration. Um, in our specific region, in the central region, we reviewed data from nine medical units that revealed only 23% of abnormal vital signs were reported to a registered nurse in order for appropriate action to be um, initiated timely, and that was a big problem. We then decided to start a pilot project in the central region. We consulted with Yolanda Wells, which was our patient safety manager at corporate office, as she had um, QI knowledge to guide us and also to do some coaching with the team. Our aim was to improve the reporting of abnormal white vital data from a baseline of 23% to 95% in nine medical units. Within 12 months, the end date was December 2016. We, we need to find ways of how then can we bring our traditional healers you know, to work with us you know, so that we then advance the science that we have. There is a political way, but there are challenges. Why? Why have we not, I think, as, a, as, as South Africa and also as a continent, not produced any of those drugs? The, the, the challenges are many. One, it is very expensive and difficult for us to develop a new drug from scratch, you know, through clinical trials. We cannot have that money. That's one aspect. The second aspect, we have regulatory problems, where it's very difficult to fund clinical trials in South Africa. And the clinical trials that are being funded in South Africa come through contract research, from industry outside South Africa to come and use the people here for clinical research. So we need to change that. But also we look at how do we regulate our traditional health practitioners so that they begin to accept working a relationship with the researchers. There's a lot of mistrust. Well, this got breastfeeding much earlier than other healthcare workers in the same hospital as shown in other studies, but due to busy work schedules mostly. So therefore we can actually see that doctor mothers are considered a high risk group with regards to the duration of breastfeeding. So the aim of my study was to describe the infant feeding intentions and the eventual behaviours of female doctors with children below the age of 5 years in Bloemfontein, South Africa. What I basically wanted to do is I wanted to see how they intended to feed their babies and what eventually happened then thereafter. And I wanted to see whether they express breast milk at work. So to conclude, I think doctor mothers in Bloemfontein are at a high risk for the early cessation of exclusive breastfeeding. The intended duration to exclusively breastfeed is high, but the mean duration is actually three months shorter. The eventual percentage of doctor mothers that express breast milk at work was less than half of the intention. And most of the respondents didn't have a dedicated room to express breast milk yet. So why is this important to you? While the WHO recommends that all babies should be exclusively breastfed for the first six months of life, but we as doctor mothers cannot practice what we are preaching. If we look at the World Health Organization, this poster that they did to support working mothers to breastfeed, our hospitals do not even comply to most of these recommendations. 
So, we as Dr. Mullers need more support in the postpartum period. Our hospitals need to be more accommodating to doctor mothers and all the healthcare workers that want to fulfill their role as a breastfeeding mother. And every workplace should have a dedicated area for expressing breast milk. At my hospital, at National District Hospital, our dietitians actually took great interest into my research. And out of their, mostly out of their own expense, created an expressing room for all employees at National District Hospital. So we've got a, a, a room with a fridge, a basin, a lot of the as well as an aircon, and it's comfortable. So expressing breast milk for my second baby is so much easier this way around. And it's amazing to see that my research has already created waves and that people are making the change. The talk was centered around decolonization of the health professions curriculum and the importance of this issue is that as South Africa we are uh, um, undergoing a very um, a big challenge in terms of health care um, provision and particularly health services that are not necessarily tailored for our South African population and one of the reasons for that is the form of training that our students or graduates are receiving um, that is possibly um, disconnected to the lived experiences that our um, communities are experiencing. So the importance of decolonizing the curriculum um, essentially speaks about um, healthcare professionals that are relevant to the context in which they function. So it's, it speaks about ensuring that whatever training that healthcare professionals receive, though it is globally um, relevant, it still has to be contextualized to the South African population. So the way in which we communicate um, health and the way in which we engage with our patients has to be in such a way that we accommodate the lived experiences of our, our, our patients considering the communities that they come from, the daily challenges that they face and in that way it makes the advice that we provide to patients on a day-to-day -day basis relevant but more importantly it makes it usable so that they are able to attain an improved quality of health. We all do know that the the basic idea behind national health insurance is a very noble one. It speaks to the critical core of our ethical responsibility to patients and that has to do with the universal access to good quality health care services, irrespective of a person's financial status or the medical condition that they actually serve for. And nobody actually, you know, can criticize that. That's the basic idea. The question will be is how will it impact on a health system in South Africa that is plagued by shortage of staff, of qualified people who are plagued by issues related to limited access to resources. And we know that a person who will actually in the end pay the price is the very patients that we all want to give access to, but it's also the healthcare practitioner who actually deliver the service. Because it is the healthcare practitioner who are who put in a situation where you have to make decisions about critical care while you actually realize that the basic equipment or the basic you know, medication or the basic skills that you need to assist that person is not available. So the question of my presentation today is how can we ensure good quality service with all the complying with all the principles of you know respect for our patients um, in terms of treating our patients with dignity and looking at their best interests. At the moment we know that the other thing that the problem that we are having is the first stage. We are, we, we are having uh, babies and mothers that die 
um, either mothers died during the pregnancy or at the time when they go deliver. We have maternal and high mat maternal and infant mortality. One of the issues that I said, because we today's uh, into, uh, the theme for this uh, research day today is to look at the five top uh, killers of the people. The we want to make sure that this research would inform us on what is it that we can do to uh, prevent people from dying. Reducing the maternal uh, and infant mortality is one of the questions that we need to deal with. Yeah. Well, in as far as the TB is concerned, because it's amongst, it has been identified as amongst number three amongst them. And there are also the non-communicable diseases like the hypertension and the diabetes. There are also accidents as part of the, of the things that cause uh, mortality on people. We have researchers at the university, the researchers. The university helps us with the, rich, the people that would undertake the research. And we, 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 you know, when you have to embark on a research, there's money involved. That is where then we, we get there, we collaborate, we, we work in collaboration with the university. Their own research, researchers take, undertaking the research, even within our facilities. They use our facilities to, 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 to embark on a research. We work together with them and their findings and recommendations, they share them with the department. And the department uses them as a guideline in a, a policy formulation that would ensure us that we embark on a, ensuring that we, we prevent the, the adverse events, the illnesses and all that. We are, we are informed by the research that takes place uh, in this in in the in the in the in this uh, colloquiums that we hold every year, and we, we have agreed with the with the university that uh, going forward, we are going to publish like the first question that you asked me. We are going to publish as the department now the things that we have benefited from this uh, research days, and the university as well is going to publish what is it that they have benefited out of this research day. So the results I presented were actually part of the PhD study that I'm currently busy with. So what we actually did is we collected samples from the routine early infant diagnosis program and all the samples which were positive we collected and then we were looking for different resistance mutations among the samples. So out of the results that I just presented, most of the infants, they were resistant to NNRTI. They actually carry the NNRTI mutations, and they were mostly resistant to nevirapine and effervirenz. And there were few which were resistant to NRTIs, which are indicated that, um, which, were, which were actually, uh, which were very few, and then uh, protease resistance was only found in the three in three infants. So with these three infants, uh, since they were newborn and, and newborn and females, so we we suspect that it was actually transmitted resistance which was coming from mother to child. But luckily, uh, this resistance was only low level resistance. High level resistance was not found. So the. Um, the aim of the study was basically that since these infants were put on the PMTCT regimen, when they will be put on the first line antiretroviral therapy, would they be actually be able to perform? And uh, since they are already carrying the NNRTI resistance from the PMTCT regimen, how will it actually affect their ARV therapy? But as we know from the NNRTI resistance that um, it actually fades away. You know, that's why our, it's not part of our first line regimen. The first line regimen actually consists of the proteas, you know, it's because we know that most of the infants might have the NNRTI resistance from the PMTCT. But it, it was a good study to see because the previous studies which have, which have been conducted, they were conducted long ago. So there was no study which was currently done to show that what is our what what uh, what is our current ARV regimens which we are currently using and if the infants are actually becoming resistant to it. So I collected around 200 samples and we have analyzed them and we found these mutations among them. The University of the Free State, Batazwara Mosebezi, was selling Molly Selemo, Wadi Patis, so ten at Amafuba Amangata, Afa Panning, Fellahelis, Atikila Bobedi, Moeban Basaisibana, Batla Tabashevisana or Na Ebe, Batla Tabatusana, Juan, Hau to Amafuba Anna, Fellah, Hurricane Carrots Bobola, or Banzabeta. So 
I am a medical physicist um, specializing in the clinical discipline of leukemia medicine, um, which is mainly used for disease diagnosis such as cancer as well as the treatment thereof. So um, what is nuclear medicine and how does it work? So nuclear medicine entails the administration of a radionuclide inside the body of a patient. This can be done orally, intravenously or by local administration, depending on the pathway of the disease. And then the radionuclide uptake actually measures the function of the organ as well as disease progression. So nuclear medicine is very useful for um, disease diagnosis and staging such as cancer, um, cancer treatment, as well as um, monitoring disease um, treat, uh, response. To look at the children with undernutrition that we admitted and see if there was anything that we could identify where we could intervene to assist with this. So the method that we used, we used a file review of all the children that we admitted in National District Hospital in the two-year period, 2016 and 2017, and we looked at the outcomes of those children to see if there was anything that we could pick up how to identify these children and how to intervene for this. In this um, figure we will see that 84% of the children that we admitted were within that first thousand days of life. So they are there. They are there that we can identify them and that we can intervene in time. The second thing that we found there was that 42% of those children were born with a bow a low birth weight, meaning that the in utero they were already undernourished. So this is where we can intervene. We need to make sure while the mother is pregnant that the baby is not suffering in those first 270 days. And the third interesting thing about the demographics was that 58% of the children that we admitted were not from Bloemfontein. They were from the rural areas around us. I want to conclude to say we identified risk factors. The risk factors that we identified, you can see there on top is the low birth weight babies, the babies from rural areas and the children not breastfed. So what is my take home message from this presentation? We need to intervene during the first thousand days of life. We've got the opportunity to make a difference in our country if we intervene during this period. We must pay special attention to the children at risk that we identified just now. We need to measure the children. When they are there, we need to measure them and make sure that we do something about it. And we need to take a proper feeding history because this is the place where we need to intervene. Uncommunicable diseases are a priority program for the National Department of Health. And as we have heard yesterday, Strokes are one of the fifth leading causes of mortality in the free state. Furthermore, it's, it's also the ninth leading cause of disability in South Africa. Stroke survivors who survive the stroke and who does not um, pass away are dependent on rehabilitation services due to the number of challenges that they experience post-stroke. Stroke rehabilitation aims at regaining lost function to enable patients to return to their family life as well as their community life. Unfortunately, stroke survivors experience a number of challenges when they are trying to access our occupational therapy services in primary health care, and their voices often stay unheard. Recommendations in this study is that we create an awareness amongst our <coughs> healthcare staff regarding depression to also educate our families to look out for signs of depression in our stroke survivors. Secondly, to address the ch challenges that they experience in accessing our services by making services accessible on primary health care level and by, in by, um, e by exploring, my apologies, for e e the use of intersectoral collaboration to address the transportation challenges that they experience. And lastly, the use of support groups as well as a group therapy model in our provision of occupational therapy treatments at primary healthcare clinics should be explored more. We did this study together with undergraduate medical students looking at the timeliness of vaccination of uh, young children. The importance of the timeliness is one part 
uh, at looking at how effective we are vaccinating children. The one part is to looking is looking at coverage of vaccination, and the other part that is not often measured is are the vaccinations on time. So what we found in our study is that indeed quite a number of vaccinations are late, and um, that is of importance in. Um, not having an immune population of infants and making in, having groups of infants that are still susceptible to disease. We reviewed um, the implementation of HIV testing at birth at MUCPP clinic. Um, the aim of the study was to determine whether the guidelines at that time were actually implemented. So we looked at all the live births during 2016 from January to December um, and looked at the HIV exposed infants, whether or not they actually received a birth PCR. We also wanted to determine whether or not um, the caregivers got a date to come back for the results whether they attended and if the babies whose birth PCRs were positive actually were started on ARVs. Unfortunately, due to a lack of a record keeping um, at the facility, we were not able to determine any of the linkages to care, but we were however able to collect data via the NHLS system and we just um, yeah, we determined that 87% of HIV exposed babies did receive a birth PCR. Only 1.1% of those PCRs were positive, but we are uncertain whether all those babies got their confirmatory PCR and whether or not they were initiated on treatment. What was alarming is that 33% of the mums were HIV infected and not data for all of them were available for whether or not they were on IRVs. And further down the line, the 10-week PCR numbers dropped dramatically. Of those babies who did receive a birth PCR, only 44% actually got a follow-up PCR at 10 weeks. So there is definitely room for improvement and further research should be done on how we can improve this. Uh, today I was presenting about the Vodacom Siaka product, uh, which is uh, Mum and Baby. Mum and Baby is a program that we have as Vodacom to inform and also educate uh, young ladies that are in the uh, during pregnancy and also uh, young gentlemen that are with partners that are actually pregnant, whereby it gives advice on what to expect and tips on where to go and what to look out for especially when you are going to be a new, new mom or even a new dad so basically the program is you can get it for free on our Vodacom uh, uh, platforms which is uh, is either by via ussd uh, star 117 star 6862 hash or on the Vodacom uh, website so, on, on the platform you can get videos uh, whereby it will give you advice on what to look for and also you get weekly messages on the process that you are actually in. Let's say for instance you are two months pregnant, basically it will give you the signs that you should look for and also if you see that um, certain things are not going accordingly, it advises you to go to the nearest clinic or even to the nearest, uh, nearest hospital. Uh, basically the platform is free for our Vodacom uh, customers whereby it doesn't even charge you any data or even airtime. So you can get it there. Mohi ho hlakile hore ba hlahlobe ba ikemiseditse ho tla bontsana hore e be mafu ana a o batla meng go fumana pheko ya teng ka phao alafa batho ka haro professor rona free start ba tla tla ba thusana jwang fela hetsana tsohle ro a letse tsona ke a tshepa ro tsohle tso e bang o diboni hlasela tv re a letse tsona hantle ha holo fela yena ya buang ke ena tenjiwe ke ena mathato le thato gatsi mo radio ha mfeketo setlolo sa ba tawong hlasela tv ho pola o ditletswa ke bombenero investments ka mahano le mosorona professor free start re seri